So today, the title of my message is Two Types of Religion. Two Types of Religion. So I was thinking about what I wanted to preach to you today. And I was like, well, why don't I just start in Genesis and see what happens? It's the first book of the Bible, so maybe it'll tell me something. And when I got to Genesis chapter 4, is a, is a very famous story about two brothers. And these brothers were named Cain and Abel. So these uh, young men were born to Adam and Eve. So these were the very first children on this earth. Adam and Eve's children. Right? So I did some research. And I was trying to figure out exactly how many religions exist in this world. It's next to impossible to get a specific number on that. Roughly, some say it's around 4,000. Now, obviously, the majority of these religions are grouped into a handful of religions, right? So the top five most predominant religions in the world are Christianity, and that includes all denominations of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, and Hinduism. These are the five main religions in this world. And then you have Sikhism and a few others that are more culturally specific, right? But ultimately, when we read the word of God, we realize that religion always comes down to two things. It's either the religion of work or the religion of grace. So take those 4,000 possible religions and boil it down to just two. Work and grace. Okay? Okay. And religion is defined as the belief in and worship of a god or gods or any such system of belief and worship. Now, a lot of people have different ideas of when different religions came about. Some say the oldest religion in the world is Hinduism, which is roughly around the year 4000 BC is when that would have been recorded as the first major religion. And Buddhism comes from Hinduism. Okay, And then you have Christianity. And out of Christianity comes Rabbinic Judaism and Islam. So these are the two main forces, Christianity and Eastern religion, basically. But ultimately, what I would like to propose to you is that there are only two major religions. And Cain and Abel show us these two main religions. Ever since man came into existence and the woman from him by God's creation, and the man and woman had children, these two religions were established. I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter number 4, in verses 1 to 8. So listen close, okay? It says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought forth the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now look at verse number 8 in Genesis chapter 4. It says, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to uh, preach your word, Lord. I just pray that your people may have ears to hear and that uh, we may all gain something from this message. Pray that the wisdom of your word may sit within our hearts and within our minds, and that we may meditate upon these things. And uh, We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we look at verse number three, we see the jobs of Cain and Abel, their employment, basically. In verse number three, we see that Cain was a tiller of the ground. 
So he was, a, he was a groundskeeper. He was a farmer, in other words. And in verse 3, he brings an offering unto God. And the offering that he brings to God is the fruit of the ground. Now, these are the crops that he's growing, right? In other words, the fruit of his own labor is what he brought to God. And in verse number 4, we see Abel, his brother, bringing forth the firstlings of his flock. In other, wor- in other words, he brings forth his best sheep unto God. And obviously this is a picture of Christ already within Genesis chapter 4. Because what is Jesus Christ called? The what of God? The Lamb of God. So we already see Jesus through the word of God in Genesis. And Abel is picturing that in the sense that he's bringing a spotless lamb to offer it to God. And Abel gave God his best offering by faith. So this small passage of scripture ultimately changed the entire world because it introduced two contrasting ideologies. Bringing forth the fruit of your labor or bringing forth the best offer that you can unto God by faith. And notice in verse 8, Cain murdering Abel. This is the first time in human history that murder happened on this earth. But did you notice that the first time somebody tries to bring works religion into this world, the result of that is death. But why did God reject Cain's offering? The Bible doesn't give us that many details as to why Abel's was okay, but Cain's wasn't. So I sat down and I really examined just these few verses. And while the Bible doesn't give too much detail, what it does say is that Cain brought crops and Abel brought an animal. We can assume that Cain brought forth his ordinary crops and maybe the excess of his crops to God. And the reason I kind of read that into this passage is that God lets us know that Abel brought forth the firstlings of his lambs. So the very best that he has to offer, he brings to God. I don't think anything in the Bible is incidental, coincidental, or accidental. Every word in here has a purpose, right? But ultimately, what we have to realize is that it was very possible that Cain offered God the excess of his fruit. He may have kept some for himself, He may have given some to family and friends and given God the rest. But when you contrast that with Abel, Abel gives him the first of what he has. Now, what shows more faith in God? Giving him your leftovers or giving him the first of what you have? The first of what you have. Because what you're telling God when you give him your first offering is that you have faith that he will provide for you. When you give him the last of your offering, you've already kept everything you needed for yourself. So I believe that is the only way God rejected Cain and accepted Abel's offering. And obviously God looks upon the heart of man. So we know everything God does is uh, just and right. So when he decided to judge Cain and Abel, we know that he did it from a righteous place. Okay, And uh, it just shows another truth of God's word that the religion of works also known as the religion of Cain, despite what a person may think, it isn't giving your best to God. It's really an afterthought once you've fulfilled your own wants and needs. Because the Bible says without faith, it is impossible to please God. So whatever Cain did, he did outside of faith. But what Abel offered God, he did it through faith. I want to read to you from Revelation Chapter number 12. So I go from Genesis to Revelation. (laughs) The first book to the last book, but it all ties into itself. Um, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So Satan's whole purpose on this planet is to deceive people. 
That is what he is living for. He, <laughs> he, is, he is constantly day in and day out looking for ways to keep people from Christ and to keep people from the light of the gospel. Because hell was made for Satan. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be in darkness alone forever. So I think that's the reason Satan's working hard to uh, use religion to deceive people. So when I say the two religions, what I mean basically is that there is a religion that God approves of and a religion that this world is deceived by. And these two religions can be categorized as the religion of the world and the religion of God. So I want to look at religion number one, the, the religion of this world. And I've coined it the work of thine hands. So I was reading in the book of Micah, which is in the Old Testament. He's a minor prophet, but minor is only in reference to the length of the book. It's not talking about the content itself. Because some of the greatest works in the Bible are a page long. And one of my favorite books is Jonah. Jonah's one page long. But everybody knows the story of Jonah, right? So when we look at Micah chapter 5, verse number 13, it says, Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. So aside from Cain bringing forth the physical fruit of his labor as an offering to God, God shows us another instance of this works-based religion, the work of man's hands. And oftentimes in the Old Testament, when you read that term, the work of thine hands, it has to do with graven images, with making statues, with making pictures that you are bowing down to or worshiping. So a lot of people say just because you bow down to something doesn't mean you're worshiping it, right? But it's interesting because the commandment of God is thou shalt make unto thee no graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor worship them. So don't bow down to them and don't worship them, right? I like how God covers all his bases in his word. And this includes images, statues, and icons But tell me, what does every religion in this world have set up in their temples? The work of man's hands. Images, statues, and icons. But the Lord Jesus Christ says in the New Testament that they which worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. And faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen, is what the Bible says. Can somebody finish this statement for me? We walk by faith and not by by sight. That's exactly right. Because what are you putting your faith in? Are you putting your faith in the Lord God? Or are you putting your faith in the work of man's hands? The religion of this world doesn't recognize that man is made in God's image. Rather, the religion of this world seeks to make God in man's image. When you worship photos, and when you worship creation, and when you worship statues, icons, you are worshiping the work of men. But when you worship the Lord God himself, you are worshiping not the creation, but the creator, who breathes life into this world. In other words, when you are going about to establish your own righteousness, You're making yourself God because you're applying your standards to this world and your own sense of morality to this world rather than seeking objective truth, objective morality. But the religion of this world lifts up the work of thine own hands. We see it with Cain in the beginning of Genesis. We see it with Micah rebuking the Israelites. And I want to show you in the New Testament that this religion of this world has been around forever. Even in the time of Christ, he is rebuking that religion. Turn to Luke chapter 18. The Bible goes Matthew, Mark, Luke. 
Luke chapter 18, verses 9 to 14. This is called the Pharisee and the tax collector. And this is a great example of the two religions that exist. It says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And these are the words of Jesus Christ. He says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now this is a great truth in the New Testament between not just two people, but two ideologies. The ideology of the work of man and the ideology of the grace of God. Every single religion in this world, besides the pure religion of God, in his word, in some form or another, is promoting you over God. Work over faith. But don't be deceived because most so-called Christians are deceived by the religion of this world. Trust me, I go out, I talk to people. The most people I win to Christ go to church every Sunday. And they've been baptized. And they've been going to church since they were a little kid. But they don't know the truth of the word of God. That's a shame. But in verse number 11 of that passage, it says, The Pharisees stood and prayed thus. I love this detail. Pay attention to every word in the Bible. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Now, the fact of the matter is, a lot of people think they're praying to God. But if you're not trusting in God, God doesn't even know you. That prayer is going up in the air and it's void. But the Pharisee prayed with himself. Because the religion of works does not actually acknowledge God, because this religion doesn't come to God on his terms. But notice the humility of the publican. He showed humility and true faith. He recognized that he's not capable of working his way to God. Rather, he just asks for mercy and forgiveness. And God saw his heart and he forgave him. And I love verse 14. It says, I tell you, this man, the publican, who is hated by society. This guy is a tax collector. They probably called him all type of bad words. You know, he's working for the Roman Empire. But he had faith in the true God. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Now, that's a very important word in the Bible. Think about the word justified. This is how I like to explain it to people. When God proclaims you justified, what God is saying is that it is just as if I never sinned justified. That is how God views you when you place your trust in him, just as if I'd never sinned. And the religion of this world is organized by the devil himself, and it seeks to have people trust in themselves rather than God. Just as this Pharisee was praying with himself, but pretending to talk to God, all he could talk about was himself. I thank thee, God, that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Can you imagine sitting in the temple and praying and letting God know your heart and the guy next to you is like talking bad about you? (laughs) But the publican had so much humility that he was only focused on the Lord. I think we need to do more of that today. Put more of our focus on the Lord and less on what man may think of us. So I'm going to read to you from 2 Corinthians 
chapter number 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. And the Bible says, in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 4, St. Paul says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God... Now, that's a lowercase g. When you get back to your room and you read your Bible, in verse 4 it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now the true God has established his religion through his word. So can we also assume that the false God of this world has created a religion of his own? Because the devil himself doesn't try to take what God does and flip it on its head 100%, right? What he wants to do is lead people slowly into deception. Because how else can he get away with it? He can't just say, I'm Satan, worship me. No, Satan is trying to establish himself as God. But the problem is he can't because he still has to answer to the Lord. It's not possible for him to become God. But the Bible does call him the God of this world because he is in charge of this world. He is influencing politics. He's influencing government. He's influencing churches. Can I say that? Because he is. He's influencing man, woman, boy, and girl to stay away from the light of the glorious gospel. Because remember I said earlier, if I had to be in darkness for all of eternity, I don't want to be by myself. So he has to bring people with him. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ has his sheep and Satan has his goats. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, he's going to separate his sheep from his goats because God is a God of division. What does it say in Genesis? He separated the light from the dark and he's going to separate his saints from the children of Satan. Now, most people today don't know that they're being deceived by Satan. Because he works very subtly, right? He's a serpent. He deceived Eve very subtly. She didn't know any better. And, you know, if you eat of this fruit, well, what does the devil say? He says, yea, hath God said? And notice he didn't just flip what God said on its head. He just changed a little detail. And he said, the reason God doesn't want you to eat of this is because then you will be like him. That is not what God said. God didn't tell them that they couldn't enjoy what he created for them. And that they couldn't partake in many great things that he had waiting for them. But what Satan does is he goes off of your pride and your ego to try to build you up to become your own God. That's what every religion in this world teaches man. That you will become your own God. And these are your rules. But the word of God establishes the boundaries and he establishes the standard that he expects because if not we're all just going through life trying to be our own gods and our own creators but i want to read to you from matthew chapter 7 and this is a great example of the importance of god knowing you that pharisee thought he knew god but it says he prayed thus with himself he's not he's not praying to nobody he's talking to himself But in Matthew chapter 7, the Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Real quick, I want to show you John chapter 6 verse 40. Because a lot of people think they know what God means when he says the will of my Father in heaven. But instead of me telling you my opinion, I will tell you what Jesus Christ said. He says in John chapter 6, verse number 40, he says, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The will of God is that you put your trust in Christ. And in verse 22 of Matthew 7, he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? 
and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I don't know how many people on here are on social media or TikTok or YouTube or whatever. I'm not either. But when I was, people would always quote this passage. And you know what they would say? This is the scariest verse in the whole Bible. It is scary if you're trusting in yourself. Because what did they say to Jesus? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? So what I'm doing right now is called prophesying. The Bible uses the word prophesy for the word preach, right? So not everything that is prophesied is talked about in the future. Uh, because in, uh, in the work of Solomon, he says the prophecy to Lemuel. So he's talking about his mother giving him a prophecy that happened when he was a kid. Okay, so the word prophecy doesn't always mean future events, right? But they say... Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. These are people talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. They thought they knew him. They're preaching in his name. They're casting out devils in his name. And they're doing many wonderful works in his name. But what does Jesus say unto them? I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What does that mean, though? Let's compare spiritual things with spiritual, right? The Bible says we should always compare the Bible with the Bible. Not man's opinion, not tradition, but what God himself said. The answer is actually found in the book of Nahum, chapter 1. Come on, Jack, don't put your Bible down. You know I'm preaching. <laughs> Nahum, chapter 1, towards the end of the Bible. Nahum, chapter 1, in verse 7, it says, The Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. It doesn't say he knoweth them that do many wonderful works in his name. He knoweth them that cast out devils in his name. He knoweth them that trust in him. Because the religion of God is a religion of faith and of trust. The religion of this world is a religion of man and his work. But... Why not just take the work of Christ? His work is way better than our work. So when I get to heaven and God says, you know, Denny, why should I let you in? I don't know why this is a thing that people always say. Why should I let you in? God's not going to ask you that if you trust in him as your savior. Okay, but hypothetically, God, why should I let you in? What if I said, well, Lord, you know, I was just such a better Christian than everybody I knew. I mean, I did a nursing home. I talked to strangers all the time. God would just see pride. That is not the will of God for man. All I would say to God is, you said, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So all I did was believe in him. And the Bible says in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. When you accept Christ, all you're telling God is, I believe you'll do what you said you would do because I trust you. And the Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what? If you trust God and you trust his word, he's going to come through with that. It doesn't say whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might be. It's possible if you're a good enough boy or girl. No, shall be saved. Lastly, I want to look to you, look with you at the religion of God. I've kind of destroyed this whole religion of this world, I believe. Um, but this is the good news, right? The religion of God. Ephesians chapter number 2. Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians chapter 2. And the Bible says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when I go out and talk to people and they say, well, I believe it's by faith, but you also have to do the works. But it, it says not of works. So are we going to follow man's teaching or are we going to follow God's teaching? Because he says, you can't work your way to me. I'm not like the gods of this world. You can't pay your way to me. You can't offer... Your, uh, the, the excess of your crops to me. 
All I require of you is trust and faith. And Romans chapter 11, verse 6 says, For if by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And if you actually read that passage, he says the same thing the other way. He says, and if by works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. It's works over here, the religion of this world, or it's grace over here, the religion of God Almighty. You get to pick. The Lord said, choose ye this day who you will serve. Will you serve him or will you serve the wicked one? Your choice. I can't make you believe. I can come here and preach to you every two weeks like I do and scream and yell and probably have the workers kind of like, this guy's kind of crazy. The reason I do that is because this message is the message that God wants every person in this world to know. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The last verse I want to show you is Romans chapter number 10. And the difference between the religion of works and the religion of grace is that in God's religion, we can serve God out of love, out of service, and out of appreciation. Now, I don't know how many of you have had children in here, but I have mine right there. I don't know what he's doing, but just being himself. I hope when he grows up, he wants to do right by mom and I because he sees our love to him. I'm not saying there's not a place for a little bit of fear, right? I'm sure some of you had to lay, lay a hammer down on your children, and that's, I think that's perfectly okay. You're the parent. You have the right to discipline your child. But ultimately, you want to serve out of gratitude, not out of fear. But what every religion of this world teaches you is to serve out of fear. But with God's religion, you are his workmanship because he loves you. And the Apostle John said that himself. We love him because he first loved us. And we were separated from him through our sin. But since God is goodness in and of himself, he made the path of redemption for man. And God's promises last forever. And if you accept his religion... You no longer have to try to work your own way to God. Because instead of working to God, you can now work for God out of a sincere heart. And you can be a blessing unto others in that. The last verse I want to show you, Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10 in verse 3. This is what it all comes down to. This is the whole sermon in a nutshell. This is the true distinction of these two religions. Romans 10 verse 3 says, For they, now Paul is talking about the Jewish people, the Israelites of this time who were rejecting Christ. But this applies today. This is the living word of God. Okay, God is talking to you throughout every single word of this. He says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. You can either have God's perfection imputed unto you, or you can try to make yourself perfect. And you know, and I know, that ain't possible. Okay? So what it ultimately comes down to is trusting in man and your own work, or trusting in the Lord Christ and his work. God says the only way is through Christ and his work. I know it's unpopular, right? Because you can't preach what the Bible says today or you'll get canceled. Well, you, I don't have anything, so you can cancel me, okay? I really hope that this message sits well with you all. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I thank you for the amazing workers here that allow this ministry to happen, Lord. I thank you for all of the saints gathered here. I pray that this message may be edifying to them. And uh, Lord, I pray if there's anyone in this room who doesn't believe in you, that they may simply trust in you, that they may trust in the work of Christ and, and stop trusting in themselves, Lord. And uh, I just, I thank you so much for being gracious to us and loving us, creating us and giving us life. I pray that you may bless everyone in here's week. 
that, Lord, that they just may be a great testimony of you. I just pray you may shine uh, through all of this. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.